right. Welcome, everyone. I am so glad to be joined again by the wonderful Dr. Carol Smea, the super brain behind the Mind Pet Platter. Welcome back, Carol. Uh, thanks so much. It's great to be with you again. It's awesome. Yeah. They, uh, today, we're going to be talking all about dogs' senses, especially their sense of taste and, of course, their sense of smell, which just dominates their world, right? I'm excited to learn. You always have so much awesome information about how dogs see and process the world. Well, and so do you. So I'm looking forward to learning things from you as well. <laughs> oh, hopefully I have a fact or two. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, I just wanted to start off this conversation. Um, and I think it's sort of where I ended up last time is just mm -hmm. to make pet parents aware that our animals and our dogs are really driven by instinctive behaviors. And um, I like to give the example of a German Husky one-year-old who in 2017 fell off the back of a boat in, off the coast of San Diego. And they looked for eight hours trying to find this dog and couldn't find it. And for days they had people out searching for it. So they assumed that the dog didn't make it. And lo and behold, five weeks later, on a island two miles, over two miles from where the dog fell, um, he was seen on this island. It was a military installation, but nobody was living there and there were no domesticated animals at all. And some military people were in a truck, they see the dog, and the dog comes running up and jumps in the truck like, okay, I'm ready to go home. And lo and behold, this dog was fine, survived five weeks and through some of the worst torrential rains that that area had ever had mm -hmm. and survived on rodents and fish. And this is a one-year-old German Husky mix. So obviously didn't have a lot of training and survival skills, but right. it, just, it just goes to show you that um, our animals are extraordinary. Their instincts and their sensory circuits are all designed to be who they really are. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about some of these instinctive behaviors. The first one, of course, is the survival instinct which everybody is pretty familiar with. Dogs do have the capability to survive. But then there's also the prey drive instinct. And mm -hmm. I like to bring up my little um, former Pippers, who was a 14 pound Havanese, uh, the least threatening dog in the world. But anytime she saw a bunny, she was often running across that field. And mm -hmm. any dog who sees prey it just immediately kicks in. And then the other instinct I want to talk about is feast or famine. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people will say, why is it if a dog gets into garbage or a bag of food or whatever, they will just eat the entire thing. Mm -hmm. And really, they are trained by Mother Nature. You don't know when your next meal is coming. So make sure you consume everything. And all of these instincts play a really vital role in how we feed our pets too. And I'll be talking about that a little later on. But um, let me get started with the sensory circuit. And um, again, just sort of looking back, when you look at wolves, mm -hmm. their original ecology, was to hunt large prey and small prey. They were pack animals and they deconstructed carcasses and that's how they ate. Then as they came closer into our lives, they started living off of scatter feeding and um, it took them away from the carcass somewhat. It was sort of mixed but um, they were still sort of roaming on their own. And then all of a sudden, when we bring them into our homes, we took their food world and placed it in a bowl. And, right. you know, one of the things I love to talk to pet parents about is 
um, why do you feed from a bowl? And most people will say, you know, I never really thought about it. I have no idea. That's and what you do. I have a dog. I, I put food in a bowl. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And um, but the bowl is basically a convenience for us. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole thing about understand instinctive feeding and their sensory circuit is the realization that we need to look at feeding from their perspective if we're going to create a healthy feeding environment. So, yeah, we often think of dogs as these small, furry people, right? But really, they process the world so differently than we do. And we have to honor that a little bit. Yeah. Try and to understand them. And they see the world quite differently. Mm -hmm. And it, it would actually actually be sort of fun to try to be a dog for a day. <laughs> right. you know? And just see how we would how we would do. Because sometimes at the zoo, I, I'm looking at some of the animals and going, I don't think I could survive that way. <laughs> I have a really difficult time doing <laughs> that. But um, let's start off with their sense of smell. Mm -hmm. It is their most powerful sense. And in fact, they have over 100 million sun sites, which is pretty extraordinary, mm -hmm. uh, versus our 6 million. So the discrepancy in our smelling capabilities is quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that I find interesting as well is depending on the breed of dog you have, they can have much more powerful sense of smell or less. Mm -hmm. So take a wild guess, Brad. How many uh, scent sites does a bloodhound have? Oh, I don't know. I'd, I'd guess upwards of 200, 300 million even. See, I've heard reports so of them cool. going real high. Yeah, that's so. those are some powerful noses right there. <laughs> You are absolutely right. Bloodhounds have kind of the most powerful uh, sensory component at 300 million, followed wow. by basset hounds. And you know what? Why their ears are so long? Uh, I, I've read before it's so they can they can almost stir up the air with them in order to catch the scent better. They can also move their nostrils independently to try to really figure out and hone in where a scent is coming from. Those ears are to scoop up the scents from the ground. Those mm -hmm. are ground trackers hmm. versus the uh, German shepherds and the German short-haired pointers that are more air trackers. Mm -hmm. But that explains, because wow. I, know, I know a lot of people with basset hounds go, oh my God, their their ears are getting into everything. They're just smelling. <laughs> They're enjoying right? the whole thing there. <laughs> <laughs> That's on purpose. That's by design. Yeah. <laughs> so again, you know, Mother Nature is incredible. They always have this extraordinary way of making sure that animal can function. Um, but I I think one of the best comparisons, and I forgot the name of the veterinarian who, who uh, came up with this, but he basically compared the power of a dog's ability to smell to a teaspoon of sugar. They can smell that in an Olympic sized pool. Wow. And so when you look at our world and how we perceive things, our vision is so powerful and overtakes everything in our life. It's hard for us to even recognize smells in our lives unless they're really powerful and they either really smell good or they really smell bad. Right. So our whole way of viewing the world is entirely different. Dogs actually see the world through their nose. Mm -hmm. um, and I also wanted to bring up that they have an, a, an additional olfactory apparatus that's located at the top of the roof of their mouth um, and uh, behind their teeth. And this is also capable of detecting odors. A lot of it is in communication and identif identification of other animals. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is we don't fully understand the capacity with which Jacobson's organ can really function. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in newborn pups, 
uh, that organ plays a key role in being able to find the resource for milk from its mother. Hmm. So there are new studies showing that it can play a role in food identification, but it's it's chemically oriented and right. many odors that we can't detect, they can detect with Jacob, Jacobson's organ. Yeah, I've so, also read that it's often used for, or that we think it may be used for pheromone detection as well. To yeah, help them, uh, you know, is that, is this dog who I just met, is he friendly? Is this female I just met, you know, maybe in a mating kind of mood? You know, right. it's, uh, yeah. Right, hmm. a absolutely involved in the whole mating thing. And and when you think about it, one, one of the things um, I, I love to talk about is that, the section of the brain that decodes smells in dogs is 40% larger than it is for humans. Mm -hmm. So That's that is the dominant sense, 40% larger. Huge. For us, we have a giant occipital lobe, right? We have, we can, our vision processing center is just a huge chunk of our brain. But for them, it's that that olfactory center. It's that scent processor. Exactly. Yeah, so cool. Yeah. Exactly. So not only are their noses better equipped than ours, they have so many more scent receptors. But then a huge chunk of their brain is dedicated to decoding that information and putting it to use. Exactly. That's so cool. Wow. Exactly. Don't you wish you had a nose like that? <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not really sure. <laughs> Maybe for a day. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, and the other thing is, um, like you said, um, they can actually move their nostrils independently of one another. And what they're trying to do is to put it together a picture, a 3D picture for the brain. Mm -hmm. But the other interesting thing is that, you know, we inhale and exhale from the same passages. Dogs have an interesting um, approach because they have slits on the side of their nose where mm -hmm. it aids getting the air out and pushing new air in. So all those set, uh, the different odors can be spread along the area in the nasal cavity. Wow. And so um, the other thing is when we smell, we'll go and sort of, Breathe in a big breath. Mm -hmm. When you notice your dog, they're taking in smaller pieces of air. And mm -hmm. I can't believe I'm sniffing like a dog on this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You I was can, just you can doing it too as you were talking about it. much time doing this, Brad. <laughs> right. <laughs> you but, have to but, try but, once it's described to you. I was doing the exact same thing as you're describing it, just sitting here. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Here we go. Okay. Like a dog, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm never going to live this one down. My friend <laughs> Beth is here. I, I'm sure she's going to make sure there's a recording of this. <laughs> but the reason for that is each time they inhale more and more air, it's spreading that out across the whole nasal area. So mm -hmm. you'll never see a dog take a big inhale. It's these short ones saying, I want more and more information to cover all the cells that I have. Yeah, wow. Okay. So um, that's just a few of the facts. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this as it pertains to feeding your pet. But um, I also want to talk about taste. Mm -hmm. And Brad, how do you think dogs taste? I don't know. Uh, it probably depends on how you season them. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, all right, now it's obviously too late for this kind of stuff. <laughs> I spent too much time working today. <laughs> What's happened to us? <laughs> Well, we have a comedy show going here. As well. I guess that's what it is tonight. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, the interesting thing about taste is mm -hmm. that it is far less developed and far less discriminating. And in fact, the one important thing 
that I want to share with your audience tonight is that dogs actually taste their foods by smelling it. Mm. Which I think we do too more than we appreciate. Like when you have a cold and your nose is all plugged up and you're like, I can't taste anything, man. This food tastes salty, but that's it. You know, yeah. I don't think we appreciate the aromatics enough, but imagine the difference in the foods that you're eating when you have that cold versus when you don't. And now take the flavors of when you don't have a cold and just multiply them by what, a hundred, a thousand? Yeah. They must be tasting, uh, it must be such a different experience than we have when we're eating. I know they have less taste buds than we do. Yeah. But since a, such a big part is smell, it, it, they must be able to taste things that we can't even dream of. Yeah. Well, dogs have only 1,700 taste buds versus our 9,000. But even more importantly, and I know we're going to do an episode on cats at some point in time, cats only have 473 taste buds. Right. <laughs> Barely anything. So their ability to taste is really so much longer, so much lower than dogs. So really, we have one sixth as um, powerful as our ability to taste. The taste mm -hmm. factor just isn't there. But... It still plays a role, and Mother Nature has this unique way of fine-tuning each of the senses to make sure it operates to benefit the dog. So they do have the same four taste sensations, um, but they operate very differently than they do with us. Hmm. So they do have bitter and sour taste buds located in the back of their tongue, um, and they do have salty and sweet in the front of the tongue. Uh, but a dog's taste receptors are really designed more for the meat fat diet. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a highly developed salt receptor. Uh, and that's mainly because the ancestral uh, meat diets already contained a high amount of salt. Yeah, so, they didn't have to seek it out. It was already present in every meal that they would normally eat. So right. no reason to even go looking for it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Right. So basically, by having less of an affinity for salt, it's nature's way of prohibiting excess salt intake for them. Hmm. Um, and then the other thing is they, they do have this bitter, sour taste profile. But a big part of that is so they can detect toxins and poisonous foods. Mm -hmm. So those types of chemicals or whatever may exist in their environment, they're immediately detected so the dog can discard whatever is in their mouth then. So again, it really is designed to protect them in the wild. Um, so now that we have that, the question is, can dogs taste the difference between foods? And mm -hmm. some of the studies that have been done have basically shown that they can detect differences between meat and non-meat diets. And there was one great study that was done with um, wolves and dogs, and they had the option of raw meat versus kibble <clears throat> and most of the time the dogs and the wolves would wait until they could get access to the meat really and only under conditions where they were seriously hungry and getting weaker did they go to the kibble so wow. again that ancestral meat diet operates, and that's where their preference is. Mm -hmm. But um, the other interesting thing is that they can't differentiate between flavors such as chicken, beef, fish, and pork without their sense of smell. <laughs> so, so their ability to discriminate flavors has to come through the sense of smell. Wow. So they can, so the tongue, the taste buds are there basically to kind of prevent poisoning. <laughs> They're there. That's kind of a safety mechanism. And all, all the enjoyment is really up here for them. Is that, 
it, you know, kind of that's better. a very good way of putting it because their ability to distinguish between, you know, like plant material and meat or fruits mm -hmm. and meat, you know, it, it's sort of like mother's nature perfunctory thing. You need to understand these basic things. But then when it gets into flavors, that's where the nose comes in. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why you see sometimes when you're feeding your dog, they'll open their mouth and try to bring in the air surrounding it. They're trying to get a flavor profile, basically, of what's on their plate. Huh. Interesting. Um, and Jacobson's organ does play a role in that because it's located at the roof of the mouth. When you see them open their mouth, a lot of that is related to Jacobson's organ, getting mm. those aromas up. And um, this also explains why, and I know this may sound strange, but um, why do dogs sometimes feel that garbage is a best resource? Like you come home, and your garbage <laughs> is all over the place. <laughs> right. The aromatic by containing like meat leftovers or whatever in there, that dog sitting there and smelling that going, mom must have left a meal for me somewhere. You accidentally left it in there. I know you put it in my great big bowl. That's really hard to get into giving me a workout today. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. So that's, that's really one of the key reasons. And so if you're getting ready to leave home and you're smelling things from the garbage, you may want to get it tied up and take it out because you're creating a, a resource allocation for your dog. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> it's not their fault. It's your fault. <laughs> you're putting this, these delicious things all together in one buffet. <laughs> so it's a little hard to get to. That's fine. I'll make my way in when you're not home. Right. <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. I love it. Um, and just an FYI for everybody, um, it's really interesting because they do have um, special taste buds for water at the very tip of their tongue. Mm -hmm. And uh, this becomes more sensitive after they eat things that are very salty or sweet and it encourages them to drink more water. And this is nature's way of saying, we're gonna protect you against <laughs> Wow, it's the dog. It's the dog <laughs> saying, this water tastes really good. Go drink more of this water, right? <laughs> I just had a meal and this is the best water ever. Oh God, I love it, I love it. So that those are really the two core components, but it shows how smell is the dominant force in how the dog sees the world and comes to the meal experience hmm. and how taste is sort of a perfunctory low level assessment. But when you're talking about happiness and satisfaction and all those other things, you know, how do we approach feeding? So mm -hmm. I wanted to take sort of a broad stroke um, and the way different ways that you can feed your dogs. And the first thing is with the bowl, now that we know what the nose is all about, the bowl actually holds food hostage and mm -hmm. inhibits them from the sense of smell at meal time. And this explains why there's food gulping, because if they just see a pile of food and there's no way to pull things apart, they're just going to chomp down on it and inhale it because that feast or famine drive takes over. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other thing is this is why dogs do food dumping. Okay. Dumping the food out. They're going to spread it out. It allows them to really see and smell. This is what I want to eat first, second, and third. Right. And when you talk about enrichment, there's no better enrichment than letting your dog, so to speak, explore the food carcass and make their own food selection because their brain is programmed for that, that 
sense of smell decoding operation in their brain, that's enrichment. You're really stimulating the thinking Mm -hmm. of your dog in the way that they're meant to be stimulated. Right. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to eat this bit of liver over here first, and then I'm going to move over here to this little bit of kidney. And there's some heart in this bite. And I'm going to go for that one next because my brain tells me I need, I need it. And so it smells extra good to me right now. Yeah. I mean, it, it's sort of funny because people always have these questions. Well, like, why did my dog eat that? And why did they do that? And why did getting their nutritional balance they're programmed to do that, but if they can't smell it, they're mm-hmm. not going to be able to resource it. Hmm. So it's a very compact way of looking at things. Yep. Um, so that that's sort of the, the situation with bowls when it comes to um, the sense of smell, but also the sense of taste. And that's why getting into the notion of more of a charcuterie becomes so important, not only for smell, but for taste as well. Because mm-hmm. having everything piled high, it's basically mm-hmm. like us eating out of a fast food container. It's just shovel it all in. You don't really spend that much time with it. Right. You're taking a nice meal, shoving it all into, uh, I wouldn't even say a burrito, shoving it all into a big old piling mess and just gulping it yeah. down. Whereas you could be taking these things and, oh, I'll take a bit of mashed potato right now and then a little bite of beef and stir it in that gravy. You know, we like to take our time and enjoy our food, too. So I can see why my dogs would want the ability to have their food spread out a bit, be able to take their time a little more and be a little choosier about what their next bite is going to be. And, you know, when we eat from fast food containers, typically we have less taste satisfaction. Mm -hmm. We're still hungry afterwards. And those same principles, think about it, if you're dog is gulping down a bowl in 30 to 40 seconds, Mm -hmm. of course they're going to be hungry again because all that food is coagulated going down, hits the stomach, and boom, that's it. So there's none of the enjoyment or interaction with it. Right. Absolutely. So um, then another thing is when you're, if you have a dog that eats very, very fast, I know, uh, there, are, there are multiple types of feeders where it has projectiles or things hitting into the nose of the dog so they can't get to the food. Oh, we're going to make it harder for you to eat. Yeah. Put these little, <laughs> little <laughs> pictures on there, almost spike kind of things. Yep. Get in your face. That'll well, and I do the analogy, how would you feel if you're sitting at the dinner table and somebody comes up with a mixing spoon and starts hitting you and you're trying to jab around it? It's like Hold down. person. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get out Not of going way. over to his house again. Yeah. Oh, dear. That so, guy was rude. <laughs> So one of the things that uh, I'm hoping people can understand is that when you have these projectiles going into the nose, it is punitive for the dog. Because remember, they see the world through their nose. And so you're, it's like somebody jabbing something in our eye, basically. Wow. But there's more fundamental reasons to this as well. When the nose is hitting into something, it causes the inside mucous membrane to start to swell, which Mm -hmm. can become very painful. And in the process of trying to get to the food, the other thing uh, that occurs is particles get caught in the nostrils and it dries out the membrane. And if a dog's membrane is not moist, the dog cannot smell. So you're blinding. So you're basically blinding your dog with that. And, you know, there's lots of videos out there where dogs are trying to break the feeder or push whatever's blocking them to break it off. And the reason for that is they're protecting their nose, but also they're trying to engage with their meal in the way that nature intended them to engage with it. Hmm. So some of these feeders out here, you know, when I first started seeing these designs with all of the the prongs or the spikes that stick up, I thought, oh, these are kind of, I mean, they make them look attractive. Yeah. 
some of these companies are doing a good job of making them look cool. It's all oh, that'd be a cool fixture in my house, but it's really not ideal for my dog. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, just, I, I know we talked about it before, just watch your dog eat, mm -hmm. see how he operates, see how he uses his nose. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, bowls are not designed to fit a dog's nose. So they typically struggle to work around it and push food up on the side so they can try to get to it. Honor thy nose. The one thing is to honor your dog's nose. Let him have the freedom to mm -hmm. use it to the fullest capability that he can. My dog used to relocate his food a lot. He would take it out of the bowl. I'm going to take it over here on the floor and finish eating it because I want to get out of this thing. And did you feed your dog in a corner? I have fed my dog in a corner for a while. Yep, the bowls were in a corner, in a busy room. Uh, <laughs> kind of shoved in a china cabinet over here on the side. Yep, absolutely. So they're just, yeah, and then they'd take a few bites and look around. Is anyone about to jump me? Is anyone competing with me? Yep, we move some of the food out and or take a bite and walk over to us and then go back and take another bite. Yep, all those different signs, yeah. Well, the, the one thing we never want to do is feed our dog in the corner of a kitchen because mm -hmm. you're blocking their peripheral vision, the bowl blocks it, but it also, the sides of the walls, they really feel like they're cornered animals then, which heightens anxiety, which is probably why he relocated the food. There was too much of an anxiety situation there. Mm hmm and then their ability to hear is so extraordinary. It's the second most powerful sense. So they're hearing all these noises going on. They're blocked in. And dogs communicate. When they change their feeding location, they're basically saying, I don't feel so good about this area. You're going to have to right. change this, Dad. <laughs> right. Absolutely. It'd be like one of us getting fed in the bathroom. We're going to pick up our plate and move to a different room. I don't right. want to. I don't want to eat right here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're just not listening to them but they're telling right. us <laughs> dog's telling you something guys yeah oh, oh, we actually have a question i'm going to pop this up real quick this relates to something we were talking about earlier and we were talking about salt um jeanette wants to know how much salt do raw fed dogs need in their diet and jeanette if you're feeding a meat-based raw food diet you shouldn't need to add any salt as far as i know um a there is already salt present in animals. I mean, we all have plenty of sodium in us. It's something that we need in order to live. And so your raw meat diet is already going to have some. If you're getting a commercially made one, like Steve's or something, uh, then you don't have to worry about it at all. I certainly wouldn't add any extra salt. That's a good thank question, you. an excellent yeah. question. Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, then the, the last thing I'm going to talk about, uh, are types of feeding designs that require a lot of licking on the dog's part. Mm. And, and um, <clears throat> the one thing to consider is that the feast or famine drive makes that no say if there's food there, I got to get to it. But on some of these designs, the corners are so tight or it got stuck in the material. So the dog is sniffing and smelling the food, but he can't get to it. Mm. And it leads to obsessive compulsive licking. And that's when the dog is just licking so rapidly and you see the body tense up and they'll even get to a point where they try to tear the object apart to get to the food. Again, mm -hmm. this is their natural being. They're taught to go after a respect of food. So if you see a dog doing this, it, it's causing frustration. That obsessive compulsive licking does not help them in having a positive relationship with food. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and any obsessive compulsive behavior is, you know, not good when you see it with your dogs. Yeah, not something. Uh, it, it's them communicating with you. It's them telling you something. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Pay attention. Yep. Exactly. 
So um, the, the key things that I wanted to leave everybody with is um, whatever theater you do, of course, we have the original mind pep platter because we based it on their sensory components. So first of all, there's no sides or projectiles that can hit into the dog's nose. Um, it's, so they're really free to taste their meals. The broad surface allows for the food to be distributed everywhere. So you're letting not only their sense of taste, but their sense of smell say, boy, what do I want to eat first, second, and third? What do I like? What does my body need? And you're giving them the best enrichment that they possibly could have. And then everything with the pet platter is designed so every speck of food can be picked up. Uh, we designed it so the dog's tongue can actually fit in every scoop, crevice, and ridge. So wow. that way, we have lots of videos of dogs getting into that last speck of food, <laughs> just in case. Without that compulsive licking, right. <laughs> right, right. So it really does, <laughs> right, uh, for the scoops, we designed it to resemble the ends of bones so they can, that licking mm -hmm. releases positive licking, not negative licking. They can do it calmly and in a relaxed way. And also, um, you can use your toppers to spread all over the food, which creates more of that enrichment, more of that taste profile that's exciting to them. Mm -hmm. And um, you can also freeze on here to create little ice cream cones with dog's milk or bones broth, which dogs love too. So you can bring in a lot of different taste elements into a simple meal that doesn't take a lot of time but the whole notion of the charcuterie really pays off for them and it's their carcass that you're basically creating for them so when you think about it meal time is the most important part of their day and i'm working on a lot of things um, related to a dog's happiness by bringing a satisfying meal where they can engage and truly taste and make their own food selections. You're allowing them to be who they really are. And that brings them happiness because 95% of their time in the wild was spent hunting, foraging, and looking for food. So um, this really is about them. It's not about us. It's about what they need to have a satisfying uh, meal. And I will say this for people who, who will watch this, most finicky eating or picky eating is related to the feeding environment that you're providing. Mm -hmm. And there's always a solution to it. And we've never had one failure <laughs> and I can't find the cause for a finicky eating, even though um, when at one conference, a, a woman had come up to me and she said, OK, she said, I've been feeding my dog by hand for 10 years. There wow. is nothing, absolutely nothing you can do to make this dog stop. I have tried everything. So we gave her a platter and said, take a free pet platter. Come back tomorrow. Let us know how it goes came back and she said, oh my God, I can't believe it. This is utterly amazing. The dog will no longer eat out of her hand anymore. <laughs> and, and what we found out is that the dog's peripheral vision was blocked. Where they fed the dog, there was more noise going on and the dog was always scared. Mm -hmm. And we got her to pull it away from the corner to spread the food on the pop platter, let the dog have control. And then she wanted to hand feed the dog and she couldn't. And she sent me an email saying, damn you. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined my evenings. I loved sitting here hand feeding my dog. Right? <laughs> I know. So I just, so for anybody who has a finicky or picky eater, please feel free to contact us or whatever, because there's always a solution. All we do is go through all the sensory components to find the solution to that. That you're looking at the animal itself. You're not just coming up with ideas. What can we do here? What can we do there? 
how can we make this more difficult for them? Instead, you're looking at it really through their eyes or through their nose right. and uh, then giving them exactly what makes sense for their physiology and their, uh, right. their minds. That's so right. cool. Right. I, and you know, it, it's going to help you bond more with your pet because you're going to get into making more and more great meals and start to explore things. And like Steve Steve's offers these great meal toppers now, which you don't mm -hmm. have to do anything. You can just take it and sprinkle it around. But yep. watch, watching your dog eat it, it's just going to be like, he's going, wow, mom, what are you doing for me? This is great. <laughs> right. Now you have a bunch of TikTok videos to make too. Those of you guys at home who love making social media videos, hey, put some interesting things on the plate and record your dog eating them. It's a... Uh, no, Oh, I love it. Such a cool um, experience. I see somebody's asking uh, goat's milk. The other one is bone broth, mm -hmm. which is very healthy as well. But any sort of liquid that, that you want to use or even freezing um, like a nut butter um, for anxiety-ridden dogs, if, if you have to leave them, especially if you have a rescue who gets panicked, uh, it clings to the material because it's warmer. And we had a vet who had just gotten a rescue dog. And every time she left, he would rip out the screens and tear the apartment apart. He was so fearful. So wow. she took the pet platter, put, basically spread nut butter on it. She came back three hours later and the dog was sound asleep by the platter. Wow. No way. So... You know, there are things that you can do and that positive licking can generate those endorphins, which just relax and will put the dog to sleep. And it's really wonderful to see. Oh, that is super cool. So it's a not only an awesome feeding platform, but great for calming and buying you some time as well. Yeah. So you can work on other stuff if you have an anxious dog at home. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I see somebody else. My dog has been burping a lot while eating since the mind pet platter. Is this normal? Um, no, it's not normal. And um, I don't know what kind of food you use, but if you want to contact us, we'll basically help you figure out a way. But you should be spreading it into the ridges and uh, into the scoops. And so we'd have to understand, don't, I know when um, people sometimes get the pet platter, they'll just sort of pile the food in the middle. That sort of defeats the purpose. And then the other thing uh, for slowing is to throw different types of food in there to create more of an exciting feeding dynamic. <laughs> so just contact us on our info site and we'll be happy to help you, Christy. Awesome. Super okay. cool. Well, um, Carol, as always, it is amazing hearing all of the awesome information that you have. Um, I really appreciate you joining us. We'll, we'll have time if you have any closing, anything else you want to say. But I did promise folks that we would give out a couple bags of protein bites. And uh, I think it's about that time. So I have, I've had this up for a little bit now. Comment for a chance to win a bag of protein bites. If any of you guys are watching and have not tossed anything in the comments, now is your chance. It looks to me like everyone who is on with us right now has commented. So I'm going to give me a minute to share my screen here. All right. I'm going to hit this magic draw button. And we will see uh, who pops up. All right, Cheryl, congratulations. What a pretty dog, too. Oh. Super cool. Congratulations. We will uh, we'll reach out to you and get your uh, address and get these mailed out to you. Such a cute picture. I'm gonna hit this button one more time. I assume I have two bags of protein bites to give away. I thought it was gonna be Cheryl for a minute there again. <laughs> Debbie, congratulations. I actually know Debbie. She is, um, she's my daughter's grandmother. 
Oh, so, that's great. That's pretty neat. Yeah, super <laughs> duper cool. Congratulations, Debbie. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, cool. Well, that's always fun. I, I wish I had more stuff to hand out. I could just sit here and push that button all night. That thing's a hoot. <laughs> You're going to have your own TV show one day, Brad. <laughs> <laughs> Brad pushes the button. That's what it, all it'll be. Is <laughs> Let's see what else we can give away. <laughs> uh, uh, well, Carol, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to add for uh, before we close down tonight? Um, no, I think um, feel free to contact us at any time. I know that Steve's uh, shows a lot of different charcuterie boards using the pep platter. Um, if you want to learn how to use it or how to, you know, really make one of those taste satisfaction enrichment meals for your dog contact us we're always here to help in any way we can and the whole thing that we're trying to bring to the party is happiness to your pet and meal time is so important and when you see the taste satisfaction um it's it's overwhelming you you just feel like you've done everything you possibly could for your pets so we wish you a lot of happy eating experiences out there and make those charcuteries right have some fun with it guys your dogs love food so uh indulge them have some fun they're the best <laughs> well, thank you all so much for joining me it's been a very fun evening thank you as well carol for coming on and sharing your smarts with us um, and hopefully we'll get you back here before too long. Good night, everyone. Go give your dogs a belly rub. Go check out Mind Pet Platter. They have a ton of great information out there as well. Oh, and the coupon code is still working too. Oh, a coupon code. Okay. Uh, what is the coupon code again? Remind Steve, me. 10% uh, off. That's too complicated for me. Okay. <laughs> a talk show host. I hope the, I think the audience can respond to that as well. <laughs> <laughs> well. I'm not sure if that's a compliment or not. I'm just kidding. Um, all right. And I'm going to go ahead and type that in right now. Coupon code. Is there a... Oh, your social media person beat me to it. She is amazing. Is, is she... I, I don't... I don't have to be here anymore. She's like my brain. I love her. Thank you, Steph. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Super duper cool. Well, thank you guys all so much for joining me. Go give your dogs a belly rub, uh, scoop up a pet platter, and you know, have some fun with feeding time. It's the best time of the day for your dogs. And Thanks, Thank Brad. you again, Carol. Yep. Good to see you. Take care. <laughs>